All right, can everyone hear me? Okay, good work. Good and loud. So I know this is all, this is the last talk before the lunch hour, so don't doze off a little too soon. Um, I'm told there may be sprinkler systems in the building that I can take advantage of if necessary. I'd rather not. So anyway, we're going to talk about real time, and actually in the spirit of negativity, I'm going to talk about how we're all completely abusing it. So before I go on that 20 minute rant, I want to tell you guys just a little bit about myself. I'm Jonathan Martin. I work at the Big Nerd Ranch with our Rails and Frontend Development team. Thank you! Yes, and that is Big Nerd Ranch. You're not mishearing it, by the way. Unfortunately, I have no goodies or shirts with me. They wouldn't fit in the luggage, but um, I encourage you to go check out our website. But anyway, I also teach there, so that's my little shameless plug. So we teach front end, iOS, et cetera. So if you happen to be in the US, you should come take one of our courses, especially if I happen to be teaching it. We teach out of a nearby retreat center based in Atlanta, Georgia. So that means while you're learning about iOS and Rails, you get to listen to people zipping by you at about 60 miles an hour. So anyway, but if you can't make it out for one of our courses, you can at least follow me on Twitter. I'm at Nibbler. That's derived from the four-bit term nibble, if you're curious for any trivia. But anyway, enough about me. Let's talk, uh, talk about a subject with which we should all be pretty well versed, the 21st century. So if we were to look at the major trends of the last decade, primarily as it relates to web development, of course, we might see a few major trends. We might see the era of social media, when sites like Facebook and Twitter rocketed to the forefront as our primary form of incessant, nonstop communication. We might notice the era of web apps, when new web standards and the browser wars erupted in these desktop quality apps that were designed to rival the native equivalents. And then, of course, the mobile app era, especially as the iPhone was introduced to the market. And suddenly, everything became prefixed as mobile first, mobile design, mobile friendly, everything. So the interesting thing about mobile devices is that they introduce users to catchy new interactions through a new class of apps. For example, the iOS mail app in iOS has long been the poster child for conventional mobile design. And it's really helped the mobile ecosystem mature and move along. But they didn't set the trend so much. I would argue that the third party programs gave us all these new third party UX design patterns that have really laid the, that have really laid the groundwork for how we do our mobile design nowadays. So for example, I like to think of our favorite thumb twiddling application, Pinterest. We got a lot of design techniques from this. And then, of course, apps that were designed to consume all of our communication bandwidth, like Gmail. Or for those of us that have 16 gigabyte iPhones and we don't have enough time to waste, we use something like Pocket, which will consume all of our memory. So the accelerated pace of the App Store led to the proliferation of these various third-party UX patterns. But one in particular really stands out, I think, in its ubiquity above its peers, for which reason I propose to call the 21st century the era of pull to refresh. But as you're an unlikely contender for the Apple Design Award without it, I prefer to call it the tyranny of pull to refresh. Because somehow we've bought into the idea that the little spinner with its cute swipe gesture is the hallmark of a great app. But all we've really done is disguise um, an ugly symptom, that of polling, with some clever animation. So to diagnose the underlying disease, I prefer to wind into a related side topic the labyrinthine mind of a mobile developer, specifically all you iOS and Android developers. Now, how many of you guys develop on a mobile platform? Not web, but iOS and Android. That's good. I have one person I will offend here. <laughs> That's the idea. So as API developers or even front-end consumers, we tend to approach our data from a RESTful standpoint. So this means we introduce tight coupling between URLs and particular resources if we're following RESTful conventions. Or we might be someone like GitHub and standardize those interfaces through something like Hypermedia. Or if we're Ember-based, we might use JSONAPI.org spec. All that aside, if you've collaborated with an iOS or Android developer on any large-scale web, web API, you've probably discovered that their native API or that their ideal API is nothing like what you would want. Mobile developers typically prefer a single endpoint per page of data. So for example, the Twitter app from the home view doesn't show your followers. It only shows your timeline. And thus, what would make the most sense to a mobile developer is an endpoint which provides a single JSON array of all the tweets the user ought to see. It wouldn't make any sense to send along these followers. Now, it's easy enough for us as the API developers or even front-end consumers to provide those API endpoints if, say, it's for an iOS app. We might just design it 
to mimic the different views we have in the Xcode storyboard. But unfortunately, this design choice typically precludes any mature real-time interface. And even if we do provide those real-time endpoints, they're typically not going to be performant enough for decent use. So when faced with those challenges, why would a mobile developer opt for a real-time approach when it's just so much easier to inject that Apple-blessed spinner, which we have thanks, I'm told, to Lauren Brichter. So unfortunately, that means the state of the 21st century is, in a sense, our fault. That includes both the API developers and front-end consumers, because we've just put up with it for way too long, unfortunately. So it's a, I would argue it's only partly our fault, because we've ignored the hard problem, that of real-time resources, and instead turned to these onesie hacks and big chunks of copy-pasted code. And unfortunately, it's not just the mobile developers who are turning to the solution. Anyone who, any front-end developer who has worked with some basic real-time functionality is probably guilty of peddling code that looks a little bit like this. Now, do you all remember your lesson in CoffeeScript yesterday from Justin? I hear a lot of silence. Okay, good, so you all remember. Well, I needed the screen real estate, so I'm hoping to also garner some trolls because after all, real developers don't write actual code in CoffeeScript, and those who do aren't real developers. So I've just disqualified them. Moving on, so here I'm just using Pusher just as some two-way medium. You could use whatever you want here. And I'm subscribing to a channel called Rockets because that's what we're dealing with. This is a talk about rockets and rocket fuel, as you will see. So that is our domain. So on this channel, we're listening to a few different life cycle events, when a rocket is created, updated, or destroyed. And as you can see, all we're doing is running some very basic callbacks, passing along whatever payload the server happens to send along. So take, for example, if a rocket created event was fired through the pusher medium, we would just call create rocket, which will render out a mustache template using the data payload from the server and prepend it to some place in the DOM. The rest of the code is fairly straightforward, even if it is CoffeeScript for some of you. But really, we should be asking ourselves, why are we writing our code this way? I mean, at a glance, this code is okay maybe for one use. But if we were trying to do this in a real application, and a large application at that, we would just be calling down destruction upon ourselves because we've introduced tight coupling between an event source, the resulting behavior, and the particular type of resource we're dealing with, in this case, rockets. But we have a responsibility to that thumb twiddling generation that loves to use apps like Pinterest to generalize a decent solution that makes these resources real time by default. But I'm gonna make a claim that real time resources done well is a difficult problem. But as we all know in computer science, because all of you I assume took computer science because you're all real programmers. Good. Well, in computer science, you can't just claim anything is a hard problem. If you can't prove that the big O of something is difficult or takes enough time, you've already decided you can't even compete there. But anyway, if we want to prove this is a hard problem, there's a formalized rigorous process. It's called Hacker News, for those of you who actually <laughs> subscribe to it. And they'll help us determine if our pet problem deserves this title. Now, unfortunately, this is only a 20 minute talk, so I'm gonna save time. I'm gonna take a second proof, that by reduction. Recall there are only two hard problems in programming since all quotes are trustworthy, as we all know. And if I could just reduce my problem to one of these, only one, then I could bypass the Hacker News trolls altogether. Since I don't know how to reduce real time to naming things, I'm gonna grab that second problem, that of cache invalidation. Now, if we were to think of a cache as a large dependency tree, we would know that there are two invalidation methods we can pick from. We could either pull down the tree at fixed intervals to recompute the value, or we could propagate events back up the tree whenever a particular dependency changed. Now, both of these methods are typically used on the server side, and often you'll see a combination used, depending on how often we need things to be updated. Well, this is just a cache on the server side. What if we were to expand that definition of a cache to include the front end? What if we considered every browser tab on every user's device and just considered that that's just an extension of the cache that just happens to have the DOM, some JavaScript code space, and static assets? Traditionally, we invalidate that cache by refreshing the page. Most users, especially depending on their age bracket, are quite acquainted with that cache invalidation method. And it's unfortunate that's the best tool we've given them so far. But a real-time application is nothing more than that event-based cache invalidation method extended over a two-way medium. 
And of course, this is a JS conference, and if you're a real developer, you know about all the two-way mediums we have to deal with. So thanks to HTML, we already have several mediums available for that two-way communication. So with the topic of cache invalidation in mind, let's refactor that Rocket example and see if we could maybe make something a little more generic. So at its core, we just need to propagate these lifecycle events for a resource from the server to the client. Specifically, we want to know and propagate events whenever a resource on the server side is created, updated, or destroyed. And we want to propagate that over to all connected browsers so we can replace any stale records or potentially delete or add to the store. Now, for a Rails-based API with an Ember or Batman front end, I create a small gem. And when I say small, I mean really small. I mean, you take a couple minutes to read it, and it'll probably all make sense, even if it's in CoffeeScript. So, the reason you might want to use it is that it helps us take that rocket example and refactor it so we don't have all of this boilerplate code. And the code is actually really simple, and the results are kind of neat to watch. So let's take a look of it in action. So here's our rocket fuel admin. Once we have Robin in place, our rocket fuel admin is synced across all open browser windows. Now what that means is that I can change the fuels, caveats, and formula. Say we need to say that it's extremely explosive. And when we click the update bucket button, we're hitting Ember's save function. And once that gets propagated to the server, you'll notice it got propagated to the other browser window instantly. Now this only takes a couple lines of code with something like Robin. And we can do the reverse as well. If we made changes to the formula, it gets propagated to the other browser window as well, unless we had a dirty record. Then Ember has some interesting edge cases. Ignoring boilerplate, the code for implementing that is fairly trivial. The hardest part is just going through the particular front-end framework, in this case it was Ember, and trying to figure out the best way to deal with the store. So for example, if you're using Ember's data store, they have some really nice hooks for editing any records that are loaded into the browser. Something like Batman can also be done, but it's a little bit more complex. So all of that aside, the actual logic here is really simple to deal with, and it makes for a pretty neat demo. So Robin.js, as implemented here, makes for a great live coding demo, especially if you want to show your colleagues and get instant approval from them. But unfortunately, it can't contend with some basic realities we need to deal with. So we need to consider what users are going to make up the majority of our traffic in a given hour. It's probably going to be folks swinging by McDonald's for some coffee and free Wi-Fi. Now, we are in Scotland, so it's a little bit harder to find a McDonald's, so insert whatever coffee shop you prefer. So unfortunately, our users are not only going to be on something less reliable than a wired Google Fiber connection, but they're also going to be too busy gulping down something like a Big Mac to consider the repercussions of losing their Wi-Fi connections before an, a resource they updated in their browser can be synced back to the server. So they're going to lose changes. So now we, we ironically have to design that app offline first, as well as real-time by default. Now thankfully, thanks to Tom Ashworth, you are all experts in doing this. So I don't need to go over that anymore. Just go see Tom Ashworth if you have any questions on how to do a proper offline app. But we have a second reality to deal with, because our naive sync implementation assumes that all users can manage and store all resources on the server. But of course, if we were designing a banking site, we wouldn't want Russian hackers to have access or to receive lifecycle events about any updates to our debit card. And we also don't want to tax the server with propagating these events if no one even requested it. If we were interested in particular rockets but not others and we were the only person on the server, we don't want the server sitting there coming up with all the possible subscriptions that could be generated. So now we have two problems to solve and a handful of slides in under 20 minutes. But thankfully, as this is only a 20-minute talk, I'm under no obligation to address both of those. So I'm just going to talk about that last problem maintaining real-time sync with server-side based filtering. So this problem is actually kind of similar in difficulties to ones we've already solved before with event-based cache invalidation. Consider, how did we solve the caching problem for filtered collections on the front end? Well, if you're using a framework, it could be Backbone or Ember or Batman, or Knockout for some of you Microsoft fans. We've already solved this problem by creating list and set wrappers, which propagate events whenever a defined dependency changes. And thus, we're implicitly making a dependency tree, kind of similar to the make file 
we're, co we're codifying a dependency tree, only in this case, with collections. So in Ember, for example, sets and lists are observable. So we can conveniently build these filtered collections with something called the property function. So here I'm showing you a dump of Ember code. You don't really need to know Ember to figure out what's going on here. You don't really need to know CoffeeScript to know what's going on here because you're all real programmers. But there's a few things we do need to take note of. First of all, we want a list of all bound active rockets that will automatically be invalidated when the list of all records that we currently have in the front end changes. So in other words, we want a list of all rec rockets that have not been decommissioned. So to do this, we could just wrap our filter function. In this case, it's called active. We just wrap it with a call to property describing the dependencies. Now, if you look at this, the dependencies that we're describing are actually describing a dependency tree. So Ember is essentially giving us a method of saying, kind of like make, what things we depend on and what changes will cause us to need to update. So this is how we would do filtering on the front end side. But what if we couldn't store all rockets in memory because we're just a lonely little browser and we have 50 megabyte limits on our session or local storage store? So if we want to push this filtering back to the server, especially if we're dealing with something like reports where these filters can be fairly complex, we need to find some way or some protocol to describe this filter function. In this case, we're writing it out in JavaScript, but we need a way to describe it in such a way that it can be interpreted by both the client and the server so we can run it on both platforms. Now, furthermore, if we make the assumption that our only dependency, in this case for active rockets, if we make the assumption that it only depends on all records of that particular type, then we just need to just describe the query. So for example, in this case, we're depending, using Ember's notation, on all rockets, which means whenever the list of all rockets in memory changes, we need to recompute the active property. So we need a way to describe that query, that function. We need some way to describe it to the server so it can perform this query. Now, how we structure that query is fairly arbitrary. So long as we can generate some unique hash code for it that can be used for identification, and there needs to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between that hash code and the list of resources it is describing. So in other words, two queries with the same hash code should contain exactly the same resources at any given time, barring latency, that annoying property of light. So let's try our hand at just a really trivial query format. So here we're going to describe our queries with a POJO, where each key value pair describes an exact column value match we need to have in the database. So for example, this would describe the set of all rockets in our database with the decommission status set to false. Now from that query, we should be able to generate some unique hash code that is unique to that particular query. If it's not unique, then it's not going to be of much use to us. So once we generate that hash code, we'll just use it to come up with a channel name. Now, how you generate that channel name is completely arbitrary. Here, I like to use an adapter called Faye, coincidentally written over there by our real-time guy, Mr. Make. So we're going to be using that, but you can generate this completely arbitrarily, so long as that hash code is used somewhere in the channel name or in the WebSocket subscription name. So let's take a look at how this might look in Ember if I were to actually implement this. This is mostly a theoretical talk, obviously. So this is all pretty much pseudocode, and it's also in CoffeeScript, which is a pseudo language. So that helps. So if we had implemented this in Ember, the sequence of execution, not the implementation, mind you, which might look a little bit cleaner, it might look a little bit like this. Once we've established our query with the different matches we need, we can use Ember's data store plugin and ask it to do a find, which would just talk to our server, and it passes along that query. Now, the return value from that is just going to be an array of rockets, or technically, in many cases, it's going to be a promise. Now, if it's a promise or if it's an observable list, like the one Ember gives us, then this gives us an advantage. We can take that rockets list that was returned and hijack it. So what we want to do is we want to use whatever our two-way communication medium is. In this case, it's just, I've just called it socket. The pseudocode here is meant to work with Fay, but it's just as easy to use regular WebSockets or Socket.io. And we want to subscribe to that query's unique channel, 
and listen to the different verbs or life cycle events that could happen to any resources in that query. And whenever something does happen, then we call this magical function called react, which is not implemented, by the way. We call it, and it will look at the rockets list that we have up there and automatically inject, remove, or make any changes to that list. Now, thanks to Ember's data binding, if we're using that rockets list anywhere in our code base, say we're referencing it in another model or we're using it in the views, it'll just automatically update. So we don't have to make any changes anywhere thanks to Ember's data binding. Now, one last thing to note. At the bottom, it says it's subscribed to a fourth channel when a resource is moved. We didn't have to deal with this before because we assumed that we had access to all resources. So if a resource disappeared, it was obviously destroyed. If it was updated or created, it obviously didn't exist before. So in this case, now that we have queries which just return subsets of all the records on the server, we, if a record suddenly disappears from this query, we can't assume that it was destroyed. It could be that the rocket's decommission status was changed to true, in which case it's no longer part of the active rocket's query. So if that was the case, we don't want to tell the front-end browsers that this record was destroyed. It might be that we want to keep it in cache, especially if we happen to be on a page that perhaps shows both decommissioned rockets and non-decommissioned or active rockets. If that was the case, as soon as we got a destroyed event, we would remove it from the cache and it would disappear from both lists. Obviously, we don't want that. So moved just says that, I'm, that this record is no longer part of this particular query and it's just been moved out, but it wasn't destroyed. So that's just a little implementation detail. Now, for those of you who use something like Firebase, these are pretty close in functionality to the same kinds of lifecycle events you would see. So the last and perhaps most time-consuming part of this is actually implementing it on the back end. Here I've assumed that our back end magically sends us updates whenever these resources changes and facilitates all of this functionality. So we've got to implement this on the back end, but this is a JS conference. So we aren't going to do a full in-depth implementation of that if you want that you need to vote me into the Rails conference and maybe I'll actually implement that. So at the core though, we can do some basic functionality. So what we need to be able to do is describe our queries, in this case, a rocket query. We need to be able to describe that query probably with an object of some sort because we're all great Rails programmers. And we need to just keep track of all subscriptions that have been requested from any connected browsers and then we need to compose the various types of queries that can be computed into these objects, which can either perform the SQL query, or if you're using NoSQL, we just need to be able to perform that SQL query, or whatever kind of query it is, in some way that we can get the batch list of all records that belong to that query really quickly. And then we also need to be able to test on any particular resource if it belongs in that query. So essentially, it's set set kind of terminology. You either return all the items in that set or you say whether a resource belongs to that set. So with Rails, for example, this would just basically be a thin facade on top of active records interface in most cases. But really, the framework we use here isn't important for our purpose. We just need to be able to respond to any request for all resources in a query and then test if a modified resource should trigger any lifecycle events on that query. Now, note thus that we need to be able to observe any model or database changes. So for example, if a resource is updated through the back end, say someone happens to log into the command line interface, we need to be able to subscribe to the event so that we can test when the resource or can test that updated resource against all active query subscriptions and then potentially propagate these lifecycle events from the server back to the front end. So in other words, if we're using something like Rails, this would just be an after created or after update callback. If you're using some other framework like Node.js or you're using something that doesn't involve JavaScript, for example, it doesn't matter. You just need to be able to know when any resource is changed on the server side so you can tell the front end. So with that, that's actually all the torture I have to dispense. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, actually, on how you've solved this sort of problem before, if at all. The interesting thing I found is I haven't really seen any good implementations of 
where people have tried to generalize this real-time solution. Probably the closest thing I've seen to it is Firebase. Firebase tries to make a really good, uh, has made a really good implementation for doing these real-time bindings on objects. And the way they get around a lot of these difficult problems like transactions and merge conflicts is they just use very clever data representations. But it's still not quite generic enough for my taste, so um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on this, uh, especially as we go into the discussion track. Um, so my purpose in giving this talk was really to ask more questions than I intended to answer, so apologies if you were looking for more answers from me. So I continue looking for better solutions, so come to the discussion track, tell me a better solution, or I will try to improve my own solution. And let's continue the conversation. Again, I'm at Nibbler. SJS Jonathan M is a hashtag to submit any questions. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jonathan.